This Rabbi Yaakov Wolby podcast is sponsored by Fabuloso Household Care Rabbi Cleaner. Pastor, Fill I your home with joy. No ads on my podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Tyson's Face Tats. No Have ads. you ever wanted to look like. No sponsorships. Average Rabbi, please. Bill and Anthony's Daily Multivax. Order your six month supply Rabbi with Pastor, promo code TORCH for 10% average off. Average Rabbi. No ads. No sponsorships. No promo codes. But this is how we make money. This is not how we make money. This is not how we make money. I, I will not subject. My podcast listeners, the listeners that I love, the listeners that want to come hear Torah and hear words of wisdom and learn about their heritage and learn about Jewish history and learn about Jewish values and connect themselves with the Almighty and connect themselves with His Torah and deepen their bond with their soul. I'm not going to have readouts. Rabbi Basto, my dear colleague, I'm not going to do it. Rabbi, well, we have bills to pay. Uh, so what's the other option? Is there anything else we could do? We need help. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, maybe we do something else. You see, most podcasts, they have to pay their bills and they have ads and they have readouts and they have promo codes and they have Dollar Shave Club and Geico and mattresses. I don't want to sell you mattresses. I want to give you what you come for. I want to give you Torah. I want to give you wisdom from the Almighty. I want to give you a connection with our glorious religion and glorious heritage. But we need a pair of bills. So what we do is that we don't do any ads. No ads. No, no matter how much the average rabbi, my colleague, Rabbi Busto, insists on doing the ads, insists on doing these promo codes, none of that. We do an annual fundraiser, and that's happening right now. And the website for that is givetorch.org. Give, the word give, to give. Give your heart. Give your soul. Give a little boost, a little bit of love to Torch. GiveTorch.org. It's happening right now. Every donation is doubled. This is our only annual fundraiser. We do this once a year. Until next year, you're not going to hear about this. It's happening now. If, you, if you're hearing this right now, you should know that it's still active. Every donation is doubled. And yes, Robert Busco, he's insistent. He's insistent. Are you insistent? Well, if there's a better a little solution. Bit. I do like the multivax. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little exception for that. But no ads. That, that's the plan. We've done now podcasts since 2012, 12 years, and we're committed to this. We're committed to connecting Jews and Judaism locally in Houston and globally throughout our podcast and the many other digital offerings that we have here at Torch. We do one fundraiser a year and we want your support. Visit givetorch.org. Right now, press pause on the podcast. Press pause. Stop the podcast. GiveTorch.org. Make a donation. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, you are partnering with us. We're not going to bombard you with ads. We're not going to bombard you with fundraising emails every day, every week, every month. Once a year, we try to get everyone to give, everyone to contribute. If you appreciate our work, if you enjoy our work, if you want to support our work, if you want to support the great rabbis here at the Torch Center, Rabbi Busto, the average rabbi, and everyone else that's over here, and all the incredible work that we do here from the Torch Center Houston, Texas, visit givetorch.org right now and make a donation. Show us some love. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drive you crazy. Make the donation. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbajima.com and that website again, givetorch.org. Today I will tell you something that you will find to be quite empowering. Now, initially, when we start, you may say, oh, Rabbi, it's a bit disappointing. But ultimately, I'm convinced that it will prove to be quite empowering and even enlightening. You're going to learn a framework to figure out what you're supposed to do with your life. Promise number one. Promise number two, you're going to get an answer to a much sought after question about what we're supposed to do with our life and the, the primary life dilemma that all of us must face. Promise number two. Promise number three, I'm going to give you a solution to imposter syndrome. Number four, we're going to solve any inferiority complexes that you may have. And finally, you will learn the ultimate cure for envy. Five promises. I need to narrow your time. Let's begin. So in our parsha, we find an unusual curiosity. The entire parsha, from beginning to end, is a dialogue between God and Moshe. Of course, last week we had the instruction 
to build the tabernacle, to build the Mishkan, and the details of all the vessels of the Mishkan. And that theme continues in our parsha. God again is conveying to Moshe what he wants, some of the aspects of the tabernacle that were not touched upon last week, and primarily the garments of the Kohen and the Kohen Gadol, the priest and the high priest, and the entire inauguration ceremony to consecrate the Kohanim and to make them Kohanim, an entire dialogue between God and Moshe. And the curiosity is that Moshe's name is completely omitted from our Parsha. You scan the Parsha from beginning, verse 1, all the way to the end, verse 101. That's how many verses there are in our Parsha. And you find nary a mention of the word Moshe. And in fact, not only is Moshe's name not featured, if you read the Parsha, it's almost like there was a, a, a studious effort to try to omit Moshe's name. In fact, the Parsha starts off and God tells Moshe, and he says, you, you, you over there, and you over there, the person who I'm not going to, the person who shall not be named, you, I have some instructions to tell you. In fact, that, that term, vata and you, is featured three times in the first five verses of our Parsha, where God tells Moshe, oh, and you, and you, I want you to tell the Jewish people about gathering the oil for the menorah. Oh, and you, I want you to select Aaron and his kids and consecrate them as Kohanim and make them the garments. Oh, and you, Vata, and you, I want you to hire all the artisans and all the craftsmen to make these vestments, these vessels. So Moshe's name is not featured, but it's not because Moshe's not around. We're talking about other things. We're talking directly to Moshe, and we know the most famous verse in the whole Torah, the most the most commonly featured verse in the whole Torah is God speaks to Moshe. That is the typical format. And that format is violated in our parsha almost in a way that it seems like there was a studious effort to omit it. So the question is uh, one of the basic questions that everyone asks on our parsha, And of course, there are many answers. So if you've listened to the rebroadcast episode, you know, we run through some answers one of the answers that people say is, well, you know, Moshe died on the seventh day of Andar, which, by the way, right now, we are recording on the seventh day of Andar, the anniversary of the art site of Moshe's passing. And maybe the reason why Moshe's name is not featured in the Parsha is because he's not around. He was taken away. And that's symbolized in the Parsha. And every year, Parsha Tetzava falls out around the week where Moshe's yard site is found. That is one answer that's offered. A second answer that's offered is that Moshe, in next week's parsha, Moshe tells God, erase me from your book. And indeed, God says, you know what? If that's what you want, that's what you get. And Moshe's name was erased from God's book, but only one parsha. And every week, God said, you know what? Let's Let's push it off to the next parsha. Let's push it off to the next parsha. Let's push it off to the next parsha. And finally, they went through the whole cycle and they got to the final parsha, which means if you start from next week, the final parsha is this week. This is the final option. And Moshe's name was omitted from this parsha. Alternatively, it's been suggested, you know, Moshe is an intermediary between us and God. And the parsha is about the Kohen, who's also about the, also the intermediary between us and God. And therefore his name is omitted. Don't focus too much on the intermediary and forget about God. These are some of the answers that are given. The Goan of Vilna says something unbelievable and perplexing and peculiar and one that will get us started in our quest to see if we could fulfill those five promises that we started off with. He says, actually, Moshe's name is found everywhere in the Parsha. You just know, you just have to know how to look. Hmm, okay, that sounds intriguing. What does that mean? Says the Yona Vilna, there is a system of gematria, familiar term gematria, gematria, the numerical value of every Hebrew letter, but there's a system of gematria called the hidden letter gematria. The hidden letter gematria. Every Hebrew letter, there are hidden letters that are not featured. So for example, the letter mem. So the letter that is featured is the letter Mem. The letter that is not featured 
happens to also be the letter mem. Why? Because the way you spell the word mem is a mem and a mem. So the letter that's featured is the first mem, and the letter that's not featured is the second mem. Well, what about the letter shin? How do you spell the word shin? A shin, a yud, and a nun. So the shin is the revealed letter, and the yud and the nun, those are the hidden letters. Okay. How do you spell Moshe? Mem, shin, hey. A hey spelled with a hey and an olive. Thus, the hidden letters of Moshe are mem, yud, nun, and aleph. What is the numerical value of those four letters? Well, let's see. A mem is 40. A yud is 10. A nun is 50. An aleph is one, giving us a grand total of 101. There are 101 verses in our parsha, and all parsha is all about Moshe. You just don't know how to look for it. That's what the God of Villa says. And he says something really deep over here. Moshe, there's the revealed Moshe. And that's the mem, the shin, the hey, the name of Moshe, the revealed Moshe. And then there's the concealed Moshe. Then there are the letters that you don't see, but are still part of Moshe's name. And that's the other mem, the yud, the nun, and the aleph. And that's 101. And our parsha is a story, not of Moshe's revealed self, but of Moshe's hidden self. The parsha is all about Moshe, but not his revealed identity. It is his concealed identity. He drops the bomb. And runs away, he throws the grenade, and we have to deal with the pieces. What does this mean? What does it mean that everyone has a revealed identity? The letters of their name, so to speak, that are featured. And everyone has a concealed identity. The letters of the name that are not featured. Moshe's identity is, in fact, revealed in our parsha, But not the revealed identity. The hidden identity. Moshe is not overtly in our parsha. But we're getting a picture of Moshe behind the scenes, beneath the curtain, beyond the facade. Moshe, there's the Moshe that you know, and now we're going to learn about the Moshe that you don't know. And that's our Parsha. Amazing idea. But of course, one that demands an explanation. What does it mean? That there's a whole part of Moshe's life that we don't see, that is obscured from us, that is obfuscated in the Torah. It's here, but not fully. It's not the revealed version of Moshe. It's the hidden part of Moshe. What does this mean? If you look at the parsha, you don't see any of Moshe's influence. It starts off with the lighting of the menorah. Who lit the menorah? Not Moshe. It was Aaron and Aaron's sons, Aaron and co. And then it transitions to the garments of the high priest and the ordinary priest. Well, who's that? That's Aaron and co. And then there's a very elaborate description of the inauguration ritual of Aaron and his kids, the various sacrifices that they have to bring, and what you do with the blood and the oil, and you put it on the ear and the right thumb and the, the big toe and the right foot. Very dramatic stuff. All about coronation, consecration of Aaron and co. Oh, and then it talks about the sacrifices brought by Aaron and co. And then we finally end off the parasha with the inner altar upon which Aaron and his kids bring the daily incense. The entire parasha is not about Moshe. Even the construction and the assembly and the weaving of these garments is done by others. The whole parasha it's not about Moshe. Moshe is a total bystander of our Parsha. Everything orients around Aaron and Aaron's children. How can it be suggested? How can it be suggested that our Parsha, we learn about the hidden side of Moshe, the part of Moshe that is obscured? What does it mean that we get to peek behind the scenes, beyond the curtain, to find out what's actually happening? With Moshe. So I want to suggest an approach. And this approach, I hope, will really expand our understanding of what, what we're here to do, of what we're trying to accomplish, of what our life is really all about. 
What does it all mean? Why am I living? It's a very serious question. If you have to answer this question, what are we living for? What must we accomplish? What's our mission? What does the Almighty expect of us? Is that an easy question to answer or a hard question? I think it's easy. You know, we have we have the Torah. And in the Torah, we have the precise rules and guidelines of how to live. We have the manual for living. What are you supposed to do? Well, you're born ignorant. You're born helpless. But the Almighty, in His benevolence, He shows us a path. He says, here's how you get out of your ignorance. Here's how you find out how to live your life. He gives us the Torah. In the Torah, there's the mitzvahs. And there's the guidelines of how you're supposed to behave. How you're supposed to interact with people. A full manual for life. This is our mission statement. If I were to ask you the question, what are we here for? What are we living for? How are we supposed to know how to live our lives? What's our mission? You can say, or at least you could try to say, the answer is the Torah. Look at the rules. And I would say, you know what? That's a good answer. But it's not quite a great answer. It's a good answer, but it's an incomplete answer. And here's why. Our sages tell us that we all have a dual mission in life. We have dual responsibilities in life. Each one of us is different. Each one of us has a different catalog, a different collection of qualities, of skills, of spiritual, intellectual, material assets. And we all have, well, we all have our shortcomings, some more than others. It's been proven. We all have flaws. We all have benefits and we all have different circumstances. Everyone's unique. And why is everyone unique? Our sages tell us because everyone has a unique life mission. Humans aren't just like these automatons that are fungible, that are all identical. Cookie cutter, you swap out one, you put in another one, plug and play. That's not what humans are. We're all different. And the reason why we're different is because what is expected of us is also different. Each one of us is unique. And we have a unique mission to fulfill. And that's what we can say that the answer to our question is there's really two answers. What what are you here for? What's your mission? Well, you have the universal mission. You have the Torah, which is the same for everyone. You have a sister of mitzvahs, which is the same for everyone. And then you have something with that only you can do that has your name on it, your name to the exclusion of every other name in the world. You have an individualized mission that's tailored to you, only you can do it, only you are expected to do it. And this idea is found in many places in Jewish literature. For example, one of the most eloquent places you'll find the, you'll find this idea is in the commentary of the Gona Vilna to Proverbs. He actually mentions this a few times in Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 4. He says, Call Adam Adam. Every person, Yeshlo Derech Atzmo Lelechpo, has their own path to go upon. How many paths are there? Billions. Everyone has their own path. Because their character is not the same. And their faces are not the same. And their nature is not the same. Everyone has their own path. Yes, we all share the 613. Universal. But we each have an individual path of our own, an additional path that's only ours. And then he adds, and this is where the confounding life dilemma is found. And when the prophets existed, when there were prophets amongst the Jewish people, everyone would make an appointment with the prophet and go to the prophet and find out exactly what 
is their unique soul. Where are they unique? And what is their unique life path? The prophets served a vital function in our people. They were the ones who guided, who directed people of what they're supposed to do in life. What is your individual path? And then when prophecy went extinct, there were lower levels of prophet, prophecy called the Ruach HaKodesh, kind of the Holy Divine Spirit, that that too served the same purpose. An amazing idea. We each have a mission with our name on it. Only we can do it. And we have no idea what it is. We're in the dark. We have no idea. I always joke that not only am I not a prophet, I work for a non-profit organization. Like I'm, I'm saying I'm not a prophet. How am I supposed to know? Everyone is obligated to accomplish an individualized mission. Let me read you another eloquent sentence. This one from my grandfather, blessed memory. And I'm just going to translate it straight from Hebrew. Every person was sent to this world to fulfill a mission, a mandate that only they can fulfill. And this mission is etched on the root of their soul. The Almighty sent every individual in a specific, unique individual time, in a specific location, with specific abilities, and with the individualized mission. So what's our mission? Our mission is one of them, one part of it we know. One part is revealed. Sinner 30 mitzvot. Look at the Talmud. Yes, there are many volumes. But we have the law, we have the Torah, we have the mitzvot. We have an insight, a wisdom, a window into that world of what we all have to do together. But besides for that, we're each assigned with an individual responsibility, and that's unique to us. No one could come to me and say, hey, Walby, why are you not like Abraham? Because you know what I would say? I would say, well, Abraham, that job has been taken. <laughs> that mission has been completed. That mission is no longer needed. That's the first thing I would say. Second thing is that, well, I need to find out what, what my mission is. What is the mission that says Yaakov will be in it? That's my job. Not to find out what Abraham needed to do. Every individual is a one of one. A unique phenomenon of history that never just a prior and will never surface again. And that person's got to figure out what is the mighty one of them specifically. And this idea is found in many, many other places. So I'll give you an example. Our sages tell us that after we pass, we're going to face two kinds of judgment. One judgment is a universal judgment. Everyone is interrogated the same way. The Talmud tells us in the book of Shabbos, page 31a, a very memorable page in Talmud, because remember that story of the convert or the the conversion candidate comes to Hillel and teach me all of Torah while I'm balancing on one leg. That same page, a little bit further down, you scroll a little further down the page and you find a description of a post-mortem interrogation of a soul. And it says the following. When a person is brought before judgment in the heavenly court, they ask him six questions. Did you do business with integrity? Did you designate time for Torah study? Did you engage in procreation? Did you anticipate? Did you yearn for salvation? Did you try to delve into wisdom? Did you try to understand one thing from another? Such questions. That's asked to all. These are universal judgments because this is dealing with the 613, the universal requirements. And then our sages tell us there is another judgment, an individualized, a tailored judgment that's unique to every individual. That's found in the Midrash. The Midrash says, in the future, the Almighty will take every individual 
and will castigate them and reprimand them and admonish them as per who they are. Lefi ma shehu, as per precisely who they are. Just as we say, there's an individual mission for every person, that mission will be evaluated as per who you are by the individual judgment. An amazing idea. We're all on the same planet playing a different game. Yes, there's parts of our responsibility that's the same, but each one of us has a different life goal, a different life mission. Now, say this, tell us that we have to be cognizant of that. Back to the Gon of Vilna in his commentary to Proverbs. This is chapter 14, verse 2. The verse says, a person should go in their straight path. What does it mean, their path? You would say a person should go in a straight path. Not in their straight path, their individual straight path. Again, he explains according to these lines. Every person has a unique path. And you have to take the path that's right for you, not the ones that everyone else is taking. Yes, of course, there's part of your life. That's the, the general universal part of your life, the 613, that mission, that you want to make sure that you're in line with everyone else. But there's also a path. You have to find the right path for you. In addition, again, I'm just showing you some places where this idea is featured, the great Maharal, in his commentary to Pertiavos, chapter 3, Mishnah number 11, the verse talks about what should come first, your wisdom or your fear of sin. But the way it's phrased is not your fear of sin in general, but your fear of your sin. And again, the, the Hebrew grammar is very nuanced. Yirat chet, oh, your sin. He says, everyone has their own sin. Everyone has their own pitfalls. Everyone has their own Achilles heel. Everyone has their own struggles. And what tempts me is different than what tempts you. What I struggle with, you may find to be a piece of cake. I have, I think I've told the story in the past. I walked into the shul kitchen once. Did I say the story? If I did, maybe there's someone else who hasn't heard it. I walked in the shul kitchen. And it was like on Shabbos, and there was a lot of food being prepared. And I see one of my friends, he's holding a piece of brisket in his right hand and one in his left hand. And he's alternating, <laughs> biting from the right hand and then the left hand, eating with his hands. No plate, no fork, no nothing. So I said to him, uh, what's going on over here? Everything all right? Anything I can do to help? Do you want a plate? <laughs> So he tells me this line. I will never forget this line, and you probably won't either. He says, it's better in, in kind of the Yiddish slash Hebrew that he said it, but it's still quite memorable. He says, some people have taivas nashim, which means some people lust after women. That's their Achilles heel. I have taivas achila. I lust after food. And he kept on munching. Now, it's a, it's a funny story. It's a funny story, but uh, there's some truth to that. We just have a source over here. Everyone's unique, and we all have the particular things of life that vets us, that challenge us, and it's all different. What you need to accomplish is different. What you need to fix is different, unique to you, and your particular pitfalls that you're likely to stumble over is also individualized and unique to you. And by the way, this whole idea explains people's status in heaven. How so? The Talmud records the first ever near-death experience. Someone died and was resuscitated, brought back to life, and told their friends and comrades what they saw in heaven. And it was a great sage. And the sage died, was resuscitated, and they asked him, what did you see in heaven? It's the question that everyone's so curious about. 
So he said, I saw an upside down world. Everything was upside down. The lofty ones were lowly and the lowly ones were lofty. Everyone that I thought that was lowly, they're lofty. And everything, everyone that I thought was, was, was lofty was lowly. It was an upside down world. So the sages said to him, no, 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 you didn't see an upside down world. He saw a clear world. Our world is upside down. But in heaven, everything's right side up. You know, if you're walking on the ceiling, it seems like everyone's upside down, but really, you're the one that's upside down. And the commentaries explain that the way God judges people in heaven, it's different than the way we do it. We don't know people's struggles. We don't know people's bad story. We don't know where their soul comes from. We don't know the root of their soul. We don't know nothing. We could just judge based upon kind of a, a universal standard. And therefore, there are people that are lofty because of their comparatively great accomplishments. And there are people that are lowly because of the paucity of their accomplishments. But God judges everyone based upon their unique mission. And if your unique mission was to become Moshe Rabbeinu, to become Moses, then you became a great person, a great sage, even a great prophet. But you didn't reach your potential. In this world, you may be lofty, but in the subjective world, relative and judge relative to your potential, you, in fact, will be lowly. Here, someone who has a very little capacity for greatness, but they maximize it 100%, someone like that, in our world, will be considered lowly, in heaven will be rendered lofty. This idea, again, it's a, it's a very broad idea. It can be found in many places. It could even be, bro- it could even be broken out into a tribal level. So we have, even in our parasha, 12 tribes. Each tribe has their own stone in the chosh, in the breastplate. Each one of them has their own mission. When the sea split, it split into 12 walkable paths, one for every tribe. The Arizal says, that in heaven, there are actually 12 gates in which prayer can enter, one for every tribe. We are not just this, you know, monochromatic, single approach. There's a lot of diversity, again, within a certain rigid structure of the 613. And by the way, this did not uh, start recently. Even at Sinai, as they just tell us, the Ramban quotes this in Parshas Yisro. Sinai wasn't just one uniform experience for everyone. There were 600,000 different experiences because God spoke to every individual on their level in a way that resonated with them. And the old people heard it in a way that connects with them. And the young people heard it in a way that connects with them. And the men and the women, everyone had an individualized experience. Sinai was, again, two kinds of experiences. Everyone together witnessed something. But concurrently, there were 600,000 unique experiences. Sinai, too, was a hybrid. There was a universal revelation. And there was an individualized revelation. And we spoke about in the past how the Torah has 600,000 letters one corresponding to every soul amongst the Jewish people. And your portion in Torah, that's your letter in Torah. And that corresponds to your individualized mission. So again, we're trying to establish this idea that what we are here to do, big picture, 50,000 foot view, bird's eye view. What are we supposed to do? Find our own path. Of course, there's the 613, the universal rules, the things that are the same for everyone. But there's also something for me and for you and for everyone you know. Something specific. And I'll tell you a secret. I'll tell you a secret. Because after all, this is a special recording of the Parsha podcast and the Macro Monday Musser Masterclass. 
I'll give you a treat. There's some deep mechanics to this. Our sages tell us that there's really only one soul, the soul of Adam. And there's really, there's really only one body, the body of Adam. Now again, this is very Kabbalistic, but at a basic level, what this means is all of us are comprised of parts, so to speak, of Adam. It's almost like you divided up Adam's soul into, let's say, 600,000 parts. And that gets distributed to the whole nation. And the Midrash says that someone came to God and complained about their lot. And God said to this individual, were you there when Adam was just a lump of cells and I determined which future humans come from the right hand and which come from the left hand and which come from the right nostril and which come from the left ear and which come from the heels and which come from the cheeks of Adam? Were you there? you have any idea what the history, the backstory of your soul is? Don't tell me how to do my job. God tells this individual. What this means, again, this is a very Kabbalistic idea, but what this means is that our soul, the souls again are not fungible. Every soul is unique because it's, it comes from a different part of Adam. And therefore, just like, you know, you don't want your liver acting like your elbow because every part of you has a different function. Every part of this Grand soul, whatever that means, again, the Kabbalistic stuff we put on the side, but every soul has a unique kind of thumbprint and a unique identity and unique qualities and a unique mission. So just like we don't want, you know, the certain cells to operate, you know, you don't want, again, like we said, your liver to operate like your spleen or vice versa, everyone's unique. Because everyone on a physiological level emanates from a different part of Adam. An amazing, I think, life-changing idea. Beyond the 613 comes that part of life that we're all unique in. I'm unique. I come from this part of Adam that no one else comes from. A one-of-one of of history. We all have a unique combination of skills and qualities. Of course, shortcomings as well that has never before existed and therefore there's a mission there is a mandate that's tailored for this particular concoction and cocktail that's never been around before and when you die and you hand the keys back to God you're judged did you deliver on what your soul had to do that's all the introduction. Here's the million dollar question. How do you know what your mission is? How do you know? So it's really great to know that uh, back in the day, there were prophets. And the prophet would just take you to the prophet. Take your number and wait your turn and find out what your mission's all about. What do we do now? After prophecy has gone extinct, and even the lower levels of prophecy are not around, what do we do? We're not absolved of finding out our mission. It's a mission. It's what you have to do. It's what you're here for. This is the million-dollar question. And there have been several answers suggested in the past. So, for example, the Baal Shem Tov famously said, the whole world is a mirror. Whatever you see is a reflection of what you are. If you see a flaw, if you notice a flaw in some of the person, that is just a reflection of the same flaw that you have within you. That's one way to figure it out. Another way to figure it out, and this is something we've spoken about in the past, you want to know what you have to do, look at the tools you got for that mission. Undertake a careful and 
painstaking character analysis, find your qualities, find your flaws, amass from it a picture of your spiritual self, and use that to construct your life. And of course, there is precedent for this. The whole Parshas Vayechi tells about Jacob about to pass. He gathers his kids. I'm going to give you a blessing. Oh, I can't wait with the blessing. What's the blessing going to be? Reuven, you're first. Here's your blessing. You were supposed to be the king. You were supposed to be the priest. You were supposed to be the firstborn. And guess what? Over three, you struck out. You get nothing. Next. Isn't that a lovely, isn't, isn't that a lovely blessing? Where do you sign up for more of those? What's going on? You were impetuous like water. And that's why you lose it all. So my grandfather, blessed memory, used to always explain, this is what's happening here. Ruvain, you are impetuous. That is a characteristic that you have. It's part of your toolkit. And I know I've been following you your whole life. I know that this is a critical flaw that you have. And what's going to be? You're going to be a king. And someone insults you. You're going to launch a nuclear bomb at them. Because you're impetuous. You shoot from the hip. You're not circumspect. You don't process things slowly. You don't think about what you're going to do. You just act. Oh, and you're also going to be a Cohen. A Cohen, you have to do these 48 things in a row without skipping one, without going out of order, or else you mess up the whole thing for the whole Jewish people. What happens when you have a short fuse and a fast, happy trigger finger, and you're a Cohen, you can mess up the whole system. Don't be a Cohen. Don't be a king. And that's a blessing. Because he did the work of the prophet for his own son. I want to suggest that in our Parsha, we find a new approach. Moshe shows us another way. Moshe shows us how to whittle down your options, sift through them, winnow them down, and find out what your individual mission is. Look at Moshe. What a hero. Look at his accomplishments. You marvel at his accomplishments. Look what he did in Egypt, splitting of the sea, Mount Sinai. A great prophet. He gives us the Torah. What an amazing leader. Of course, he's going to shatter the tablets in a tremendous act of gallantry. We see the part of Moshe, the Mem, the Shin, the Hay, that we see all these amazing accomplishments. In our Parsha, we get a peek behind the curtain. In our Parsha, we see behind the scenes. We read 101 verses, and we see the part of Moshe that you don't typically see. The hidden letters of Moshe. The part of Moshe that's normally obscured, normally hidden beneath the surface. You look at the Parsha, it starts off, and really this is the whole theme of the Parsha, one demotion of Moshe after another. Let's start with the menorah. Gather the special virgin olive oil. Oh, what are we going to do with it? We're going to take it, give it to your brother. Give it to your older brother. You know how much that uh, wrinkles me, right? Give it to your brother, and he's going to do it. He's going to light it. You have no say in it. You're not going to be able to do any of the work associated with, with the menorah. Who does it? Not Moshe. What does the verse say? And you should command them. Not Moshe anymore. You. God's telling Moshe. Moshe, the menorah, it does not have your name on it. Your name is not here. Okay, well, what's next? Next, take your brother Aaron and his sons and separate them from the Jewish people, and they're going to be the Kohen. Wait, I thought I was going to be the Kohen. In fact, Moshe did serve as a Kohen until he was demoted. Take Aaron, your brother, his four sons, and make them the Kohen. To add insult to injury, make them clothing as well. Make them clothing. 
And how do we how do we describe Moshe? Where's his name? His name is not there. And you. In this, the coin, it does not have your name in it. Well, at least, you know, maybe I'll do some work, I'll contribute. The fifth verse of our parsha. Speak to all the wise people. Let them do the work for you. Delegate to them. I don't want you actually constructing these vestments. Again, Moshe's name is not present. God is telling him, this mission does not have your name in it. Behind the scenes, we see a different picture. When you look at the story of Moshe, you see all the things that he did do. And our parsha, you see the things that he did not do. And our parsha, you find the things that don't have his name on it. If you look at his responsibility in heaven, his mission, Moshe's mission, it doesn't say his name here. It doesn't say it not in this, not in this, not in the whole parsha. All the things that Moshe does not need to do, it has the names of other people in it. And this got me thinking. There was one other demotion that Moshe experienced hitherto. There was one other time in the story where Moshe was demoted. In Parshish Yisro, Jethro shows up and after this whole lavish welcome ceremony, the next day he wakes up and he sees Moshe very busy. From morning to night, Moshe standing, answering all the questions. And Yisro, the McKinsey consultant, says, wait a minute. There is a better, more efficient way to do this. Did you ever hear of the idea of comparative advantage? Comparative advantage? What does that mean? Appoint underlings, lieutenants, leaders of 10, leaders of 50, leaders leaders of 100, leaders of 1,000. What does he say to him? Chapter 18, verse 21, he also addresses Moshe, and he omits his name. The same words that kickstart our parsha. Ve'ata tetzaveh, you should command, you should select, you should appoint. Not Moshe. Jethro tells him, ve'ata techazeh, and you should look and find the people to replace you. Find the people that are competent, judges. Find the people that are honest, that are not going to accept any bribes. Again, Moshe's name is omitted. This is not your job. It doesn't have your name in it. In Etri's parasha, we're going to read an amazing verse. God is going to tell Moshe, I actually don't want you to be the general contractor for the Mishkan, for the tabernacle, there's this uh, kid. Uh, he's 13, but he's uh, very precocious. He's very precocious, and he's got all kinds of abilities, all kinds of wisdom. I want you to appoint Petzalel, Benuri, Benchur, who's actually Moshe's like great, great nephew or something like that. I remember that uh, very great uh, nephew. He's going to be in charge. And of course, you'll oversee it, but he's in charge. But how does Bitzal get introduced? Re'e, see, Karasi B'Shem. I have called with his name, Bitzal, Moshe. In this, your name is not featured. You know whose name is featured? This little precocious, prodigious kid, Bitzal. There are parts of life, Moshe, that have your name on it. And that's part of your mission. And then there are things which God assigns to someone else, and it doesn't have your name. And whose name does it have? Re'e Karasi B'Shem. Look at the name that's appointed in this. It's Petzalo. You must step aside. You're a bystander. This is not your role. And Moshe, of course, processes these emotions with grace. Can you imagine? You're the greatest prophet. You just went through 40 days of arguing with angels and trying. And then there's a kid. He's a kid. He doesn't even have any, you know, peach fuzz. Doesn't even shave yet. Little kid! And he's going to be doing this over me? And Moshe is very, is very graceful. And he capitulates. But I think it's obvious that he should do that because he understood that God gives a mission for you and a mission for you 
animation for you, animation for Moshe, animation for Aaron and Aaron's kids and Betzalel. And when God calls your name, you must rise to the challenge. And when God omits your name, and he says, you, you over there, Vata, and you, that role is not part of your mission. Our status tell us, this is a little scary. If you're listening on the podcast, you might want to fast forward a little bit. If you're here, sorry, you're out of luck. <laughs> Close your ears, I guess. I say, just tell us that after someone dies, they have to face various stages of judgment. One of those stages of judgment is called Chibut HaKever. Don't Google this. I'll tell you what it's all about. Chibut HaKever means the beating of the grave. Doesn't sound pleasant. It gets worse. Our sages describe angels coming with whips of chains and they're beating someone up in the grave and they're asking only one question. And it's a question that we think we know the answer to. And we're a little bit puzzled by this description of the poor hapless chap in the grave who doesn't know the answer to this question. The question is only two words. Short words to boot. Ma shmecha. What is your name? What's your name? The person doesn't know. What does that mean? It means that your name, it's not just the moniker, the title, the honorific that people call you with. It refers to the name and the mission that God gave you. If you make your whole life, you make it and you're finally in the grave and you don't know what your name is, you haven't found out what your mission is, you haven't found out what is, is this Ve'ata Tehazeh? Is this Re'ek Rasi B'Shem B'Tzal? What's, what does this, where does it say my name? Where does it not say my name? If you don't know that, the angel deservedly smacks you up a little bit. Your mission here is to find your name. Find that mission and go do it. It's your responsibility. How do you know what your mission is? So we have a few answers. And I think in our Parsha, we find another answer. The things that have your name in it. You feel feel driven towards them. You feel compelled to do them. You feel like you don't have an option to not do it. Your heart is speaking to you and telling you this has my name in it. Again, we're not talking about the 613. That's one part of responsibility that we know. The part that we don't know is what is my specific mission? And to answer that question, to find out what has my name in it. The things that we feel driven by, the things that we are energized by, the things that we feel that they're speaking to me, that is a little window of prophecy. That is God telling you this is assigned to your name. And by the way, the opposite is also true. The things that are not assigned to your name, you'll feel no compulsion to do. It will seem foreign. It won't feel like it has your name on it. The answer to the question is A, have awareness of this whole idea, and B, be on the prowl, be on the lookout for those parts of the mission that have your name on it. If you listen carefully, you will be pointed to your calling and find out, like Moshe did. Does it have your name or are you called you? Hey, you over there. You over there, do this. Do this, do this, because it's not your job. Or is it Re'e Karasi B'Shem? I called this by your name. This is your mandate. When we started, I gave you five promises. Let's see if we delivered. I promise that you will learn a framework of what we're supposed to do with our lives. I think we answered that satisfactorily. You have a dual mission. One mission, just like the one revelation at Sinai, uniform, universal. A second mission, that's yours. That has your name in it. 
the very difficult life dilemma is how do I find my mission? So, of course, we referenced two answers to that question. One of them, the Baal Shem Tov, it's a mirror. Find what the world tells you, what the world reflects back to you. And one, the idea of look at your tools, find out what you have, find out what your strengths and weaknesses are and design your life in accordance with your discoveries. And now we find another answer. We look at Moshe and we look at the part of Moshe that you don't see. It's all Aaron. It's all Aaron. It's Betzalel. Moshe's name is not featured. And we learn there are some things in life that have your name in it and that you have to execute upon. You have to discover. You have to figure out what it is. You got to do it. Find what is calling you, what feels like it's a mission for you. If it doesn't have your name in it, it's not your responsibility. Now, again, if it's part of the Sitch 13, a different story. But beyond that, what has your name that is your mission? I also promised a solution for envy, imposter syndrome, and inferiority complexes. And again, if you recognize that this is a single-player game, the Talmud tells us every person has to say the world was created for me. Why? Because only I, ha- only I have this mission. And therefore, effectively, the world was created for me. In my mission, I'm the only participant. To be envious of someone else is to assume you're playing the same game. You might as well be considered different species because you're a species with one mission and they're a species with a different mission and those two are unrelated. I have unique, unmatched mission, but I'm also given the tools to do it. I should never feel inferior. Am I an imposter? I'm not an imposter. The Almighty believes in me. If I'm here, the Almighty says, you have a mission that only you could do. Again, an empowering idea. I'm one of one. I have to do it. There's great power accorded to me. There's something that I can do that no one else can do. Even Abraham can't do it. Because otherwise that would be part of his mission but also it's one that has great responsibility. If there's something that I must do, no one else can do, it's all on my shoulders. But there's a beautiful idea here. The Almighty wants us as his partners. He gave me, he gave you something to do. But he will also guide you and direct you to how to find that mission. And provided we listen very carefully and we see what has our name on it, we see what is our mission of commission. What does God want you to do? And also, what is the place of omission? In what areas must I step back? Okay, let's get to this week's exquisite insight. In our Parsha, we read about the garments of the high priest. And one of them is the aphod. It's like an apron-like garment. It's closed in the back like a jacket, opens in the front, and it has two like shoulder straps, almost like, almost like suspenders that go up onto the shoulders. And then they connect via chain to the breastplate to the choshen. Now on those shoulder straps are two stones. They're known as the Avne Shoham, the Shoham stones, one on the right shoulder, one on the left shoulder. And on these stones are etched the 12 sons of Jacob, six on one and six on the other. Now, these are called Shoham stones. Why are they called Shoham stones? Well, the answer is simple, because they are made out of Shoham. There are all kinds of different rocks and minerals. And one of them is called a shoham. And the shoham stone, that's the kind of stone that you have to get for the shoulder, for the shoulder pads, for the stones that are inlaid in the brackets that go on the a foot on the shoulders. Now, what's interesting, if you look at the 12 stones that are in the Choshen, in the breastplate. There are also 12 stones, and we're told the names of those 12 stones. 
Ruvain, his stone is called Odem. This is in our parsha. Odem, Pitada, Bereket, Nofech, Sapir, Yahalom, Leshem, Shavo, Achlama. These are the names of all the stones. Tarshish, Shoham, and Yashpe. These are the 12 stones. You'll notice that the second to last of these stones is also called Shoham. So how many different kinds of stones were there? There were 12 stones. 11 of them, there's only one of them that is that particular stone in the Choshen, in the breastplate. And then there were three Shoham stones. One in the breastplate and one on either shoulder strap on top of the aphod on either side of the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. Now, which tribe was associated with the Shoham stone? The answer is Joseph, the second to last, the second to youngest of Jacob's sons was Joseph, and he had a Shoham stone, and that same stone was on the aphod. Why are the stones for the aphod, specifically the Shoham stones, the stone of Joseph? So let's suggest an answer. You may recall the aphod, the apron-like garment, appeared in the past in a very curious place. In Parshas Vayeshev of all places, Joseph, he was employed by the wife of Potiphar, Potiphar and his wife, Mrs. Potiphar, and he was being seduced by his master's wife, and he resisted. And then one day he was going to capitulate, and something very dramatic happened. Actually, we did a podcast, Parsha podcast, many moons ago about this particular idea. Rashi tells us, that something very dramatic happened. As he was about to capitulate and yield to temptation, he had a visitation, a visage, a hologram appeared in the window, and that was the appearance of Jacob, his father. And this hologram told him, Joseph, in the future, this family will burgeon into a nation, and we will have a high priest, and the high priest will have eight garments, and on the aphod, there's going to be two stones, and right now, your name appears on one of those stones. But if you capitulate, your name will be erased from this stone, it will be removed from this stone, and instead, you will be labeled as a patron of harlots. Do you want to go ahead with it? And this experience gave Joseph the strength of character to resist and to walk away. So I think we know what the connection between these stones, part of the aphor, have to do with Joseph. But what's the idea? What's the insight? So I saw an amazing Midrash. The Midrash says that these 12 names are the two stones in the Aphod, the Avnei Shom, the Shoham stones, it had 12 names, one of every tribe. And when a member of that tribe did a mitzvah, the name of that tribe on the Avnei Shoham, on the Shoham stones, the name would get a little brighter. And when someone from a given tribe would sin, the name would get a little bit dimmer. It would grow a bit faint. So here's my suggestion. It seems like, again, we don't know the representation of all these various vestments and garments, what they all represent, but perhaps the idea is that these stones, they represent the current spiritual standing of the nation and of every tribe individually. And of course, they're constantly in flux. Sometimes you have a good day, sometimes you have a bad day, and sometimes things are going swell, and sometimes you reach a low point, you're always changing. And in fact, with Joseph, we learned that someone could even be kicked out and booted from that fraternity. If he would have sinned, it would have been so egregious, his name would have been removed permanently. So the Shoham stones represent how a person is standing. What is their current spiritual standing? And Joseph, he overcame temptation like no one else in history. He reached the apex of marshalling whatever 
tools you have to overcome and to resist and to remain steadfast in your loyalty to God? And therefore God says, not only is your name going to be nice and bright on these stones, but I'm going to select those Shoham stones, the same stone that's your stone, those are going to be the stones of the aphod, the Avne Shoham. Not only is your name going to be there, but your name is going to be all over it because you really embody what this is all about. I thank you for listening. Have an amazing rest of your day. Have a fabulous rest of your week. And have an exquisite and splendid and terrific and spectacular Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week.